How's a woman from Canada end up going overseas and fighting ISIS? How's that happen? Well, you take a plane and you fly over there. And, um, I was just motivated to do something with my life. I was bored. I hadn't. I was feeling like I'd not contributed anything. You know, you can call it a midlife crisis even. Um, just needed to do something important that, that I felt was important. So. I uh, was looking for a cause. I was going to go to the Libyan Revolution, but I didn't have the, the means, the time, or the equipment. And then when I learned about the YPJ, I really identified with that, the Women's Army, and because uh, they're fighting for women's rights. And just, everything about it was just like so inspiring to me. These girls were actually fighting. They weren't some patronizing logistics or something like that. They were actually there fighting, which is something I had always been interested in. And you know what they're fighting for was something I'd been interested in. They're also fighting against ISIS, which is, you know, something I think needed to be done. And I saw it as a true good versus evil fight, you know. So it's just everything about it just, you know, connected with me. So Had you I ever picked up a gun before? Yeah, yeah, I'd use them in the prairies, you know, the chase away animals and stuff like that. Did you know you were going to end up having to use it against people at this point? Well, yeah, yeah. I, I knew that it was going to join a, an army that was fighting ISIS. I knew that, you know... Part of the job is killing the enemy. So. No, I mean, thinking even before that, just thinking of when you're growing up, I mean, you, you couldn't have seen that far in the future when it comes to that. I mean, that's amazing you, at that point. So it was like the question, did I ever think I'd go and kill someone? Exactly, yeah. No, no it was not something, it was not a, a trophy thing for me. I know a lot of people, it seems to be, yeah. they're looking for legal murder. But no, for me, it was not something I was ever eager to do. Still not something I'm eager to do. I have a rating system called the four E's. This movie falls into it. It's entertaining, it's educational, it's empathetic, and it's emotional. And when you have those things in there like that and you fear us women, uh, I look at it as almost like gender empowerment. You took your power and you brought it over there and so you, the women bonded. Talk about that aspect. Uh, in a lot of war movies that we see, you see how the men bond in their units, and you hear about that, how the comrades in arms and stuff like that. Um, with, I, I was wondering if the same thing happens with the women, and it, and it certainly does. You know, and in the, in the movies where you see the guys are always making like, you know, uh, homoerotic jokes too, the girls do that too. They're always bugging each other about, yeah, I'm gonna go shower, do you need a hand in there? You know, stuff like that, it's kind of funny. And I, was, I realized, that, oh, girls are just as bad as the guys. You know, so it was funny like that, but it was also, the emotional bonding, you know, like, there's a lot of downtime where you're sitting there and waiting and, and people get sad, you know, they miss their families, you know, sometimes they, they had to leave their families for different reasons and sometimes their families are all dead, you know, and because I was so much older than the average age there, like most of the girls are like, any army, the infantrys are usually very young, you know, late teens, early twenties, and then here I, when I first showed up there, I was 46 years old, so a lot of them, I became their surrogate mother. Right? They'd be like, Mama! And I'd be like, no, 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 hava, which is what we call each other, like friends. Like, hava, hava, and they keep insisting, Mama, Mama. I'm like, okay, fine. And then, you know, they want hugs and stuff like that. But, so there's that bonding, too. I was like, became like the mother figure for a lot of them. Which, I was also Mama Bear sometimes around them when, you know, when fighting started like that. And also, I'm just like, you know, well, I gotta protect the girls and stuff like that. But they're feeling the same way towards me. We have to protect Hannah and stuff. But that's, that's normal. When you're in a fight, you're not thinking about the revolution, you're not thinking about the bigger picture, you're thinking about the people in your unit, you gotta protect, you know, the person next to you, and they're, they're trying to protect you at the same time, so. How long were you there for? A year in total in Syria. I went back and forth a few times, so. Uh, how many times did you go back? <clears throat> I was in Syria twice, and I made it to, I went back a third time, but I couldn't get over the border the third time. This was just this past summer. So I stayed in Iraq and did some work there. Um, when you left, you talked about the guilt of not being there, coming back and having good food to eat and, you know, obviously the showers and stuff like that and then feeling that remorse of, I need to be by my sisters, which mm -hmm. I thought was empathetic. That's the emotional part of the four E's. Talk about that. We, we grew up in such a, uh, op, or, what's the word, I can't think of the word. We're so entitled here and we have yeah. so much first world luxuries and stuff like that that we, for, we don't know what it's like to really do without. And I've always, I say, I talk about this in the film where I always have the luxury to go back whenever I wanted to. But they can't, they're stuck there forever, right? I mean, it's virtually impossible for them to get out of there. And I feel bad about that. Like, I feel really guilty 
coming here and you know even sleeping in a normal bed because yeah. over there we were sleeping on the ground and stuff like that right and a lot of the girls you know came from that close to that environment too right they came from the bigger cities and the bigger cities are pretty modern and stuff like that and all that was destroyed so they'll never have it again or they'll probably never have it again it's just I don't know it felt bad especially the first time I came back you know, going out for dinner with friends and feeling safe, especially, you know, and they're back there. I just kept thinking about them being there, you know, sitting in the dark with no electricity and, like I said, rice and cr uh, crushed tomatoes. And stuff. Do you know, I felt what you felt when you described that. I, I, I felt I could feel what you were feeling, which was weird. Yeah, yeah. That's well, yeah. good then. I mean, it's good that you felt it. That... And so I understood. Um, and you know, and I've seen a, a lot of these war films, and I've interviewed a lot of them, going way, way back for when the first war started in, you know, '91. So, and I have two people who actually worked with me, and uh, she was blown up twice. She was a gunner. She had the big gun, and she has PTSD, and she you would never know it. She's beautiful, but she's got that constant ringing in her head. And she has small little nightmares, but besides that, she's good and just like tiny memory loss. But you know what? You wouldn't know she's been blown up in Afghanistan and she's been blown up in Iraq. Uh -huh. And she was in the army for eight years. Beautiful girl. And she's one of my assistants. She helps me. So I think about those things all the time. So I was thinking about a lot of what you were talking about to what you could see because you can talk about a lot of stuff and she can talk about what she went through, but it's still, you don't hear these experiences. Yeah, yeah, we're so sheltered over here in the West. We live in, our bubble is so thick here that most of us can't even relate to it. Well, you really don't even hear about someone from Canada doing this either. That's also, the also interesting. Talk about where you came from, being that Canadian going to do that. There was another American there, was there? Not in Syria, no. There was, uh, there was Samantha J. She joined the, she was going to the White PJ, but she made it as far as Iraq and she joined the Peshmerga units. Um, I think the Peshmerga have been very reluctant to send Westerners to the front to, f to actually fight. If you wanted to fight, the best chance you had to fight was to join the YPG and the YPJ. A lot of the uh, guys who were in the Peshmerga went across the border to Syria to join the YPG because when you look at all the Westerners who have been killed over there, they're all virtually from Syria, from the fight with the YPG because they go, they go and fight, right? They're right up there in the fight, so um, there's been at least one German girl, one Western girl that was killed. Um, I think there's been two, I'm not sure what the second one has been, about 30 men who've been killed, Western men. Yeah, so. Do you make, do you think you've made a difference? Not in like any body count or anything like that, but in raising awareness, yes, for sure. Right, so. I have people like in Europe, like it's been going on in Europe for a couple of years now, the media, because in Europe they're much more aware, like they know what the white VJ is there. And I uh, traveling through Frankfurt Airport last year, and people recognized me in the airport and taking photos and stuff like that. So that part, I'm making, raising the awareness. That's where I'm going to contribute the most. See, that's good. Now you can actually talk about it. The problem is you may not be able to go back as, because of certain things going on now. Well, I can go back, <clears throat> um, but there's places I can't. Like, I can't go to Turkey at all. You know, I, I, I can't even fly Turkish Airlines. Right? Turkey is run, Turkish media have run stories, you know, saying I'm a terrorist, you know, photos and videos of me and stuff like that. <clears throat> I might have trouble in some other countries like Australia. Um, I, last time I went through the UK, they pulled me out of the airport and stuff like that. So, um, the, you know, you never know in the future it could come and bite me in the ass. But right now, I seem to be okay. Like I've been, when I first came to the States, uh, I knew I'd have issues. I went to the border and I, you know, essentially turned myself in and they questioned me and then there was, it happened a couple of times, but now everything seems okay. Because inadvertently through all this media attention that I've received, it's easy to verify my story. All they have to do is Google my name and, and literally the last time I went over the border or the second time I went over the border into the U.S., they took me to a back room and as soon as the doors in there closed, they're like, oh, so you used to be a model. And I was like, oh. You guys googled my name right but at least they can do that but there's people there that who went there who don't have any attention so you know they're going to get questioned a lot more strictly like well we know you were there what were you doing there can you prove that you were on the good side on the good guys right they can't necessarily prove it right so but like i said some places i can never go to i can never go to turkey 
And you said Australia too? Me, because Australia's come down really hard on anyone who's volunteered. There was another Canadian who went there for a vacation and they kicked him out. Yeah, so they deported him, I think, to Germany. How about for going back over there the second time? Actually, the first time you go back, what was that like and some of the women weren't there? Um, well, when I went back, I had my list of girls I wanted to see again. I wanted to see my unit. I was actually going to go back to my original, my, my second unit, because that's the unit I, I really love that unit. Um, but I ended up getting distracted. I went to the academy to try and improve my Kurdish and things like that. And time just went by before, you know, and that unit ended up getting broken up and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, you, I ended up working with this one girl pretty most of my time there, and her and I became very good friends. And, and uh, I don't know, it's just, I was there much longer the second time too. I was there, the first time I was there three months and I lost 30 pounds, so I was sick, I had to leave. And the second time I was there nine months. I guess I had adjusted to it better the second time, so. Talk about when you, when you guys are eating together. A lot of the women were beautiful. They, they you know, you, when you take off everything, they still want to be women. And I found that interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's something that, we all have to wear the uniform. The uniform is a dress code and you wear the uniform 24 hours a day. We sleep in it and everything. But they have the colorful socks and the, the, the kefias, they have, they'll breed, they'll, they'll braid with uh, nice beads and stuff like that. Really, you know, they like, they're still girls, you know. They still like to, they don't wear makeup or anything, but they still like to have some color and have some fun, you know, girl things. And, and you know, and that, that camaraderie, I, I found that engaging. I really like that. Again, using one of the E's, no matter what, they're engaged. And then you talk about going out there and actually... In the West. Most of the time it's just because girls here in the West, I just have nothing in common with them. They just, you know, they want to talk about just, you know, princess stuff. And I just, like, I didn't grow up that way. I was a tomboy, you know, I grew up fighting and, you know, fixing cars and stuff like that. So I didn't, I didn't really ever have anything in common with them. And then over there, all of a sudden I was like, oh, these girls, I have something in common with them, right? And sure, they're still girls, and they're still, like, traditionally girly things, but... They also don't have a problem getting behind the gun and shooting the enemy. So, I don't know, it's just... I kept wondering, where are these girls in North America? Right? Why, why, why don't we have these girls here? So, like I said, there's only been... There hasn't been an American girl who went there. There was four Canadian girls, and one British, one Polish, one Italian, two Swedish. We raised princesses here, boys and girls. Talk about the awareness. Your job is to do what now? Uh, there's, I have two goals now. One is to help these refugee families that ask for my help to get out of there. And the other one is to continue raising this awareness, to do these public speaking and things like that. So this is important to me. I want to do this. It's bigger than me. So this is my, these are my goals now. So any way I can raise awareness, I will pursue it. Where can they go to find out about information on it? On the YPJ, you just Google YPJ. Um, there's a YPG uh, Rojava.org, so Rojava, R-O-J-O-V-A. Um, that's the Kurdish region or the northern region in Syria. That's under their, their control, under their protection. Um, if they want to learn about the film, they can go to fearuswoman.com. Uh, that's about it. If they're inter if people are interested in joining the revolution, the YPG or the YPJ, they go to ypg-international.org. Talk about when they, you know, they suggested that they follow you around. What was that like for you? When who suggested that? Making this film. Well, it wasn't the first time it's happened. There's been other groups who have done that, right? So I just thought this was just another one of those. And at first, I thought I was just going to be one little section of a bigger thing, you know, one little interview. And that's what it has been mostly in the, in the previous times. And then when they sent me the trailer, I realized this is, seems to be all about me. And then when they sent me the rough edit, I was like, oh my god, it is all about me. This is totally not what I was expecting. But it looked so amazing. It is such a good job with it. I was just like, wow, I was blown away. It's um, about your honesty and the reason why you went and what you were doing because you became a sniper. My last unit, I was a sniper, yeah. Talk about that. How did that happen? Were you that good? Well, no. When I was younger, I used to be pretty good. But then, you know, I'm 46 years old. My eyesight's not the same. I'm a little bit more shaky. So I was like, man. My best shot was just, uh, I hit a guy's water bottle at 200 meters, so, but that was the shot I was messing with them, right, I forgot I had to shoot his water bottle. Um, but, 
Uh, it's just the first time I was there, I only had my AK, and most of the fighting is just outside of that range. Unless you're doing room to room or door to door, you're not the AK. You're, everyone's shooting at the same thing. You don't know if you get your target. So when I went back the second time, I said I want to reach out further. So I want to either go heavy weapons on the Dushka or the snipers. Um, and it took a while to get to a sniper unit, and when I was there, I was only there for maybe six weeks. And then I went to the, I was helping over at the public relations office, so I left that unit. And then uh, after the public relations office, I think I was there for about six weeks, I went and joined a, a normal unit, but they didn't have a sniper in that unit. So I said, well, I can do the sniper. So they brought me a dragon off, and then I was the sniper in that unit. Did you miss that action? Or you've done a little bit enough of that where now you can focus on here? Oh, no, out. I do miss it. I do miss it. I love it. I love the stress, I love the tracers, I love the ground shaking, the sound. So is that adrenaline? I guess so, yeah. But the thing is, it wasn't like it, wasn't like it was like, rah, you know, it wasn't like that at all. It was still pretty chill and calm and stuff like that. So it's just, I don't know, it's just, I like it, you know. And and all the times I had been in a fight before, I was not able to get any videos. So up in Tel Aviv, it was the first time I made an effort to shoot video. So everything was just... Once again, I didn't have my dragon off, and I still had the AK, and everything was still out of AK range. So I just like, well, I'll just shoot video until we can get into range. So that's where I shot most of my combat video. What would you say to get the audience to see this film, to go online to see this? What would you say? just absolutely needed to do as a woman? As a woman? Not anything specific as a woman, but I did want to go for sushi. So I went for sushi. But um, when I first came back, the last time I actually, the last time I came back, the third time, I was suffering some really bad PTSD. The first couple of times I had some nightmares and some sleepless nights, but nothing really. There was one night I woke up and I didn't know where I was. You know, when you wake up and you don't know where you are, but the first thing is, I don't know where I am and I don't know where ISIS is. I don't know if they're in the, I was freaking out. But this last time, I had some pretty bad PTSD, and uh, uh, it was hard to function for the first month. I was a wreck, so the doctor put me on some prescription to help control a little bit, so it's helping. But nothing, I wouldn't say there was nothing as a woman I wanted to do. I mean, I needed to, it's time for, it's, I'm almost at the point where I need to put some distance between that now, because it's been, it's been the focus of my life for three years now, over three years now, and it's, it wears on me because I get, you know, there's a lot of positive that comes with it, but there's a lot of negative. You know, all these friends that have died, more than 30 of my friends have died. Um, another one of my friends just died last month. Um, and all the death threats. You know, I get death threats from within North America too, from Islamists, from within the countries, right? So that wears on me. Turkey, Turkish soldiers love to send me photos of the children they murdered, wow. trophy photos. Right. There was this one guy, he sent me a photo, he, had, he was holding the, it was maybe a five-year-old, by the, by the feet, upside down, he had cut it in half. Right, and you know, and, he's, and, he sent, and, he's, and he did this specifically to take a photo to send to me. Right, this is, their mentality is messed up. They're the Nazis of the 21st century. That stuff, it just wears on me, right, so. Just, like, there's, uh, when I first came back, I turned off social media for a couple of weeks there. I just couldn't deal with it, it just wears on you. Last question, where can I go and see this again? Uh, it's called, you can go to fearuswomen.com. You can see the, the film there. It's free, streaming free. Uh, Go90.com has it also. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you.